Oh, thank you, Miss Kim, for a beautiful children's moment. We want to remind you that we are a people that love children, and even during this time when things are stressful and we don't know what's going on in the world, that we are a people who care and love our children, and so we're taking into account um, how they are perceiving what's going on. And so thank you uh, this morning, Miss Kim, for doing that. We are in the midst of a series. Today is actually our fourth week, but our third Sunday in Lent as a part of our Jesus Is series. And so we talked about on the first night of Ash Wednesday that Jesus is our reward no matter what. We talked about on the next Sunday that Jesus is Lord of my life, that Jesus is Lord of our church and the church around the world, and that Jesus is Lord of all creation and how that has huge implications for how we behave as a church, especially in times like these. Last week, I told you a story about uh, an event that I went to and went down into Carlsbad Caverns and remember the lights going out in this story about a little girl who said, don't worry to her brother who was crying, someone here knows how to turn on the light. And we are people of that light. And we see that light in tons of things that we do. Earlier in the service, I talked about how we're still partnering with the fuel ministry and bringing that essential light of food to kids who need it. That is so important. We're continuing to partner in tornado relief. And if you go on our website, you can go to hilldellumc.com.org, excuse me, slash relief, and you can see the different ways that we can pack hygiene kits, flood buckets, go and volunteer, donate to the cause, whatever it may be for those families in Nashville and east of Nashville that are still devastated by those tornadoes. We are a people who bring the light. And it is needed. I, I don't know about you, but it feels like we don't want to watch the news anymore because there is just so much bad news that is going on. And, and we look on the news and we see, see, uh, we see sto- uh, cities, excuse me, like Seattle, and, and they look like a Chick-fil-A parking lot on a Sunday, right? There's just nobody there. And so we are curious, what does this mean for us? Why are we not gathering? We see grocery shelves that are just completely empty and stripped of food. We hear reports about people that are hoarding and trying to capitalize in a moment of disaster. And we begin to worry what the world is coming to. But we gather here today as a people of faith. But we ask this very important question in the midst of all that is going on, How can it be best to be a part? And as I was preparing for this Sunday, we we had a scripture in mind that we had planned for a long time before. But as I prayed and thought about it, I I had this this new scripture that I felt like God had laid on my heart and that we were going to walk through together. But when when I began reading it for the first time, it genuinely didn't make any sense to me. And so I was reading through this scripture in John chapter 2, and if you wanted to flip along, you're welcome to with me. Um, But John chapter 2, and it's the wedding at Cana. What on earth does a wedding at Cana and the miracle of turning water into wine have to do with who we are as a church in this place right now? Now, these scriptures that we're going to look at together today as I began to study and understand some of the deeper aspects of it, really came to life and began to frame some of what we're going through and how we continue to find hope even in times like these and even when we can't be together each and every day. Now, as I looked at this story the first time, I began to think that this idea of turning water into wine and Jesus and his disciples going to a wedding, that this was honestly if we can be honest with each other, it was a little bit of a mundane story. I mean, it's miraculous. Jesus turns water into wine, which is usually only a scripture that we quote when we're about 18 or 19 year old and we're sassing our parents back about letting us have a drink, right? Well, Jesus turned water into wine, right? But it's something that has a miracle, but does it really have a lasting kingdom impact? Is it really something that it advances the gospel? Because if it's not, then why are we told this story? But I believe we are told this for many reasons, and they all begin to advance the story. You remember, this is Jesus' first miracle. His mother comes to him, and if I can summarize the scripture for you a little bit, they go to a wedding, Jesus and his disciples, and and at the wedding, they begin to run out of wine. Now, maybe Jesus and his disciples showed up a little late, and maybe they put a run on the wine. I really don't know. But for whatever reason, they ran out. 
And these are festivities that go on for days at a time and continuing to be able to be festive and drink wine was extremely important to these people. It was an important part of what it means to gather together, to be a family, to be a people in a community, to get together in a common place and to begin to just believe in love and to understand what it means to be united together in union with each other, in union with the covenant of God, this is an important event. And as we read through in John 2 in just a second, we're going to begin to see how this plays out for us today. So I'm going to share with you from John chapter 2, and I'm going to start with verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Now, there is some significance here. It happened on the third day. As we are moving in Lent towards some holiday out there in the future a few weeks away, there's something important that happens on the third day. We're told that Jesus' mother was there and that Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. It turns out Jesus wasn't humdrum. He was invited to come to a party and to have a good time. And he's joining his mother and the rest of the community and his disciples in a wonderful event. Now, I'm imagining that you've probably been to a wedding before. And I love weddings as long as I have zero responsibility, right? So if you go to a wedding and you're responsible for the catering or the pictures or being the officiant or, or whatever it may be, weddings can be an extremely stressful time. Right? I remember talking to the priest, the pastor that was going down before me at my own wedding, and, and I said, You know, I'm a little nervous. What do you do when you're nervous? And he said, Well, I'm, when I'm nervous, I pray. And so he turned around and was facing the other way, and he said, He turned around, he said, Stephen, are you nervous? And I said, I'm praying. Right? Because weddings can be something that isn't always such a joyous event. They are an amazing time, but sometimes they carry with it some responsibility. And I love going to a wedding where I don't have to be in charge, to be quite honest. Those are the best weddings of all. But here in this moment, Jesus' mother comes to him. The wedding is going on. I'm imagining for us, for the way that we remember weddings, they're at the reception. They're having a blast. And Jesus' mom comes over, and she simply says, they don't have any wine. Verse 3 says, when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother said to him, they don't have any wine. Now, I've told you before I speak Southern lady. And she comes over and she doesn't make a request. She doesn't ask Jesus to get more wine, right? She must have been from Southern Israel, right? And so, but she comes over and she says, they don't have any wine, Jesus. And then how Jesus responds is pretty amazing. Jesus replied, woman, what does that have to do with me? Right? Woman, what does that have to do with me? I don't know if you've ever spoken to your mother that way, but you'd only do it once. Right? Woman, what does that have to do with me? So even Jesus is admitting in this moment, in the midst of this story, there's a question about why this is important. What does this have to do with him? What does this time of running out of something important to the people of this community have to do with with Jesus. Perhaps we know a community that has run out of something important to them. Perhaps we've been to Publix and we've tried to buy toilet paper or water or canned goods. Perhaps you've seen the pictures on Facebook of entire shelves just wiped out. Communities are running out of the very things that are important and life-giving and bring them together. And Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? Now, he comments again and says, my time hasn't come yet. Now, I love this. His mother then says, verse 5 says, his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. So she comes over and she says, they've run out of wine. She's just speaking it into the air, hoping somebody will do something about it. Jesus says, what does that have to do with me? My time hasn't come yet. And then she says, she knows what he's going to do, right? She knows he's a good son who sees the absence of something necessary. She knows he's a good son who listens to his mother. So children, if you're at home with your parents this week, listen to your mother, please. For the love of everything good and holy, listen to your mother. And so he's listening to his mother and she knows that he is going to do the right thing. 
that Jesus is going to do what is necessary for that moment. Do whatever he tells you. You see, here's what I love in this moment. Mary knows the truth, and she's showing it to us. You see, for Mary, it wasn't a question of how there would be more wine. It wasn't a question of why they ran out. If you had been to a wedding with my family and somebody had run out of wine, there probably would have been a lot of talk about which family member's fault it was that we ran out of wine. But there was no question of how. There was no question of why. There was no question of when there would be more or where it was going to come from. The only question was who. And Mary knew who. As a matter of fact, it's the only question she had an answer for. She brought her problem. She brought her absence of something important for the community. She brought her concerns and her anxiety and her fear. And she took it to Jesus. And without even asking a direct question, she just says, they're out of wine. And Jesus responds. And she says to others, Just do whatever he tells you. Just do whatever he tells you. Because I don't know how, and I don't know why, and I don't know when, and I don't know from where. But I do know who. And we bring our cares, concerns, anxieties, the things that are missing in our life, to Jesus, because we know who. As we look at verses 6 through 7, we begin to see something else going on. Nearby were six stone water jars used for the Jewish cleansing ritual, each able to hold about 20 or 30 gallons. Now, I love this imagery, right? There are six jars. What's a holy number? Anybody? Y'all can comment too. What's a holy number? Seven. Seven. So we have six jars and then we have Jesus. It adds up to something holy happening in their midst. Now I'm throwing a picture. It won't be on our screens here, but it'll be on your screen of me when I got to go to Cana and we got to see one of those ritual jars. This was for cleansing, for washing clean. This thing would have been slapped full of Purell at the time, right? Perhaps we would go looking for jars full of Purell Perhaps we would stand over it and sing happy birthday twice while we washed our hands or our ABCs. Everywhere I go in my house, when I hear the kids in the bathroom, I hear A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I'm like, oh, I'm just so glad they're smart and they know that. But they're standing in there scrubbing their hands, almost out of ritual. But you can see how huge these containers are. They're about the size of a barrel. They're a little bit smaller. They're 30 gallons, roughly. They are huge containers, and he fills six of them, or actually the servants fill six of them to the brim. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Now, now here's what I find interesting here. It says that the servants filled them to the brim with water. Now, what on earth is water going to help? Jesus, we're out of wine. Jesus, you're a little disconnected from what's going on. You don't seem to understand. Our people don't need water. They've already washed their hands. They're ritually clean. Everything's fine. We've got these jars. They're empty. It's no big deal. The one thing we don't need is more water. We've got that taken care of. What we need is wine. But you see, there was a woman and there were servants who were obedient who did what Jesus asked. And not only did they begin to put water in the jars, but they filled them to the brim, perhaps with some anticipation about what might occur. You see, this, I believe, was honestly an unhelpful answer. What are we going to do? And Jesus says, fill up these containers with water. But you see, the problem is that water wasn't exactly what they needed. They needed something else. There was something else missing. They needed the wine. They needed something to bring their community together. They needed something that brought them joy and hope 
and love. They needed something that brought together the the whole of the family and made memories that would last a lifetime. If you've gotten married anytime soon, you know there's DVDs and VHS tapes. They probably even have 4K Blu-rays now of of your weddings. And there were flowers and pictures. I always joke that we didn't have pictures around a wedding. We had a wedding around pictures because the memories last a lifetime. I love having those pictures. This was something that would last forever and they needed something to help bring them together to enjoy the moment and to have the joy of a community and a family and water just wasn't going to do it. But you see, Jesus takes an empty situation, a distant situation, a situation full of hollowness and he changes it. He takes what they already have and he brings them together with something that only he could create create for his own glory and for the glory of the people there. You see, in the story today, as I read this, what I felt like was I heard was to quit looking at what we've lost. To quit looking at the things that are absent and missing, and to put what we do have into the hands of Jesus Christ, to gather the things that we do have, the people in our life, and to trust that Jesus can do something miraculous with it, like changing water into wine. We turn it over to the one we know who. In verse 8, it says, Then he told them, Now draw some for them and take it to the head waiter. And so they did. They took the water to the head waiter. The head waiter tasted the water that had become wine. He didn't know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. The head waiter called the groom and said, Everyone serves the good wine first. They bring out the second-rate wine only when the guests are drinking Freely, you kept the good wine until now. And isn't that true of people, of you and me? The things that we experience first and know of, the things that we look forward to, we believe them to be the best. But when Jesus steps in and we give him the parts of our situation that we can, Jesus turns them into an even better situation. And that is unbelievable in times like these. What do we have to give to Jesus. Jesus takes what they have and gives them way more. I mean, six jars that hold up to 30 gallons, that's 180 gallons. Yeah. Now, I got to go to this place in Cana, and I'm going to tell you, it's not a big town. If they had 100 or a couple hundred people together, maybe out of the whole town, I think they would have been lucky. So the last time you might have had a gallon of wine, you might understand the abundance that Jesus had blessed them with. He took what they had and he gave them so much more. He exceeded their expectations, not just in quantity, but in quality. They were supposed to save the worst wine for a second, but instead when they handed over what they had, he gave them something even better than they had anticipated. You see, Jesus saves us from what we can't provide. Jesus saves us from the the lack of hope and the fear and the anxiety. Jesus saves us from the things that we can't give or do for ourselves. You see, we as people, we usually go about our business until something runs out. And then, like Mary, we run to Jesus and we say, they have no more. We have no more time. We have no more energy. We have no more hand sanitizer or toilet paper or peas or whatever it may be. We run to Jesus and we say we are out of what we do have. And Jesus' question implied in this text is what do you have? Fill the jars to the top with the time you have for the next week or two with your children or your family. Fill yourself to the top with phone calls and texts. Fill yourself to the top with the ways that you can continue to learn, 
to study, to have devotion, to sing, to learn a language or play the piano? What are the things that you have or could have that Jesus could bless and give you so much more, not just in quantity, but in quality? You see, the issue isn't whether we're depleted or not. The issue is whether we're going to take what we do have and go to Jesus or not. This is a story about a mother and some servants who obey, who know not what or when or how or why or where, just like you and me. But they know who. And when Jesus speaks to them, they listen, they follow. And in this moment, this miraculous moment, this kind of confusing moment of not understanding how this even miracle is going to move the kingdom of God forward, this obeying brings glory to God. This obeying brings glory to the people who are involved. And everyone benefits. I want us to know as a church and around the world that we serve a God that is bigger than what we don't have. We serve a God bigger than the distance between us. We serve a God bigger than this building. Since 1954, this place has been the church in Clarksville, Tennessee. Not because of these walls, but because of you. Because of the people who came before you. The people who birthed you. The people who trained you. The people who loved you and cared for you. You have been the church and we will continue to be the church. Not because of where. And not because of when or how, but because of who. We are the church of Jesus Christ. In the midst of what we don't have, we are a people who still have a lot. And my question to us as a church today is, are we going to bring that to Jesus? Are we going to examine the time that we've been given with family at home? Are we going to examine the resources that we do have and say, this is something, even though I can't see it or understand it, that God can use for God's glory alone and for my benefit. And that when I bring it to Jesus, to the who that I do know, He can do so much more with it than I ever thought. We are a people of God greater than our distance. We are a people that look to the who. We are a people that can overlook distance and time and separation and fear and anxiety to find the one who gave us everything that is good, to find the one that whispers to us in the midst of the storm, to find the one who fills us with hope, even in the midst of times like this. You see, Jesus is filled with hope, and so can you and I. It may just seem like everyday water, but our God can do a miracle with what we already have. As long as we stop looking at what's missing and we start looking at what God has already given us. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today as a people that have been focused on what's missing as a people that have lived in fear and doubt and anxiety, as a people who are worried about the future. But you are the God of the wedding feast, a God who brings us together no matter what, a God who will take the everyday things that seem so mundane and use them for an impact so huge, so miraculous that we never could have seen it before. You are the God who loves us, who provides for us, who cares for us. And we ask that you continue to make us your people. 
Continue to bring us together, no matter the distance that separates us, to fill us with your spirit, even outside of these walls. Fill the homes of each and every one of these people today, that they would feel your love and your grace and be sustained and filled with hope for the time that comes. Lord, use us for something miraculous. In your son's name we pray. Amen.